glad that you guys are here uh, this morning, whether you're joining us online, uh, or you're right here in Washington, or you're at our Vincent's campus. Uh, I'm thankful that you made time in your week um, to be with us. I think you're going to be better because you have been here today. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to find yourself walking out of here renewed and strengthened. And so uh, let me just say this. Let's, let's all think back. Um, I know it's been a long it's been a long nine and a half months, all right? So let's think back to the year 2019, uh, specifically New Year's Eve 2019, right? We are getting ready to ring in the new year of 2020. You know, the year that was supposed to mark the future, all the old movies uh, marked that as one of the futuristic years, flying cars, mass technology advancements, and people living on the moon, right? The future is here. And we were living it up, having a good time, celebrating uh, the New Year's Eve, and uh, we probably were looking forward to some of the, the big things that we had planned for 2020, right? The vacation that we were going to take, uh, the, the year that you were finally going to get the big promotion, that, that wedding, that graduation, that rite of passage, that elective surgery that you finally had put on the schedule, you name it, like any other year, I think we found ourselves looking forward to our hopes and dreams of 2020. You know, this morning when you came in, you should have found a small white piece of paper sitting on your seat. If you don't find that, you're probably sitting on it right now. Uh, so why don't you grab out that piece of paper? Uh, if you're with us online, make sure you grab a piece of paper and do this at home. Um, but here's what I want you to do. Uh, on, uh, on one side of that paper, I just simply want you to take the pen and write... Uh, my plan on that. My plan. Make sure you write it nice and big. My plan. Now, as you look at that piece of paper, I want you to take some time and think about some of the things that you had planned for 2020. Some of your hopes, some of your dreams, some of the goals that you had ready for 2020. As you do that, I just want to tell you a few things that I had in mind. Nine months ago, uh, we were moving into 2020, which would have been the first full year of the opening of our Vincennes campus. We had opened on Easter Sunday of 2019. At that point, we had just moved to a couple services just a few months before that. We were beginning to see a lot of traction, a lot of people coming to faith. Many of the people that had came some of those first few weeks were beginning to make Vincent's home, uh, and I'm thankful for those, those folks and the, the commitment that they've made to the church, uh, and many of them who have, have not only, uh, they've raised their lid in leadership and stepped to the plate to, to see more and more people come to know who Christ is. We, as a church, were becoming one church in multiple locations that was reaching tons of people in our community, and we just continually, week after week after week, we're seeing more and more people come to Christ, and so I looked at the year 2020 as a year of massive growth in both of our locations. I was excited to see God working. On a personal level, my wife and I had, for the very first time, uh, the first week or so of January, we went off on a 2020 planning trip. Uh, my parents came into town, watched our kids, and we headed out for a weekend. Uh, we grabbed some dinner one night, stayed at a hotel, got a massage, and then the next morning, uh, we, uh, we got up and we sat down. We just started looking at our 2020 calendars and marking off all the things that we were going to do. Uh, we were going to welcome our fourth child into the family. Uh, we were going to uh, we were gonna, uh, watch a a friend of ours getting married in Knoxville. We had a big trip planned to Knoxville in May. We were excited about that. And uh, then we had, we had marked off all these little uh, camping trips that we were going to take. Just so you know, you want to make memories with your family, go camping. All right. <laughs> I'm not telling you if they're going to be good memories, but they'll be memories, all right? So a uh, great uh, opportunity to make memories. So we, we marked out some camping trips. Um, our daughter was going to finish up first grade, head into second. We had two toddlers that are going into preschool. Uh, we had a year planned. I, I hope you guys have had some time to think through your plan a little bit. Maybe you've written down a couple of the things that you had thought you were going to accomplish on that side. So if you, if you haven't, scribble those down real quick. But now I just want you to look at your plan. 2020 has been quite a year, hasn't it? <laughs> there are some things that I've, I'm guessing that may have come to fruition, but there's probably a lot of stuff on your plan that didn't come the way you, you saw fit. And so I want you to do to your plan what 2020 has done to your plans, right? Go ahead, crumble them all up, right? You know, 2020, right, has been a year, hasn't it, right? That's what it feels like. It feels like our plans have just crumbled, haven't they? And as we look at our crumbled plans, right, it's a recognition that it's been a hard year. I mean, think about this, right? 
2020 has brought about some pretty crazy things. Panic toilet paper buying, all right? That's weird, all right? <laughs> social distancing, we didn't even know what social distancing was until 2020, all right? Mask wearing, home quarantining, washing and sanitizing your groceries. That's, that's weird, all right? <laughs> Political upheaval, social unrest, elbow bump greetings, curbside pickup, and this one to me is the most odd of them all. Uh, Zoom video funerals, that's, that's just, it's odd, it's odd, right? The wedding was postponed, the graduation was canceled, the family member passed away, the job got cut, the finances got tight, the relationship became broken, right? The friend disconnected, the faith wavered. Our plans crumbled, didn't they? Life as we knew it was turned upside down. You know, there's been some pretty cool memes uh, uh, popping around uh, on social media. I want you to take a look at a couple of these, right? Billy Blanks, right? But wait, there's more, right? Oh, I love it. That was a good one. That was one of my favorites. If 2020 was a slide, this poor kid, he's going to the cheese grater, all right? And there's these other ones, right? Marty, whatever happens, don't ever go back to 2020, all right? And then maybe one of my favorites, ah, yes, a nice cup of 2020. Notice where he's drinking. It's poking him in the eye, right? Uh, I, I think we can laugh at those things at first, but boy, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a, a hellish type of year, hasn't it? It's been a year that we have seen a lot of things just crumble around us. We're wishing, and some of us are hoping, that 2020 will just end. There's no doubt that we are all going to mark some season in our life by the year 2020. What were you doing pre-2020? What were you doing after 2020? Right? And the truth is, plans crumble. In the book of Acts, there's this story that we learn of by a man by the name of Saul. Saul was a religious zealot who enters uh, our scene in Acts chapter 7. He's going to have this, uh, this interaction. We first find him on scene uh, standing in approval to the death of a man by the name of Stephen. They, they literally uh, stone this guy to death. And, and Stephen, uh, as he's dying, Saul is standing there going, good job, guys. Keep up the hard work. That's what he's telling the people around him. Saul is a nasty guy um, that believed he was doing God's work by killing off those who had had come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Then there's this conversion story that is shared with us in Acts chapter 9. It's on page 890 in the Bibles in front of you. If you want to turn over there, that'd be great. Uh, and by the way, if you don't have a Bible, can I just say this? Take one of those Bibles with you that's in the chair backs in front of you. If you know somebody at home or somebody you care about that doesn't have a Bible, those, that's what those are for. We want you to be handing out God's word. We want you to be experiencing God's word in your life. One of the rhythms that Matt challenged us to last week. So make sure you're in God's word. It's on page 890 that we're looking at today. Um, so there's this blinding moment, this turning point in Saul's life, the moment that Saul became Paul. The murderer became missionary. The religion became a relationship. And from that moment on, it was all sunshine and roses for Paul. No, right? Wrong. That wasn't the case because that was the moment that the persecutor became the persecuted. In Acts chapter 9, immediately after Saul's life was transformed by Jesus, he regains his sight and his strength. And in verse 20, it says this. At once, he, that's Saul, now we know as Paul, once began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. All those, hurt, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoner to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by pr proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now I'm sure, I'm sure Paul had all kinds of, of plans. I'm sure he had all kinds of things. Even after he came to know Jesus, I'm sure he had all kinds of plans. He had seen the son of God. His life had been transformed. But catch verse 23 of Acts 9. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. Paul's life becomes one in which he is constantly on the move, constantly trying to get away literally spending the rest of his days moving from town to town, narrowly escaping death until he himself finally does die as a martyr for faith. 
In 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, we learn this of Paul's life. This is Paul speaking here to the church at Corinth. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent night and day in the open seas. I've constantly been on the move. I've been in danger from the rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Now, why I don't know if any of us have experienced the life that Paul did, I think for all of us in some way or another, as we look back over the last nine and a half months and we see some of our plans, maybe it's more than the last nine and a half months. Maybe for you, it's like the last 30 years, Right? You look back at your life and you look at some of the things that you've gone through and you just feel like your life has been in shambles. That you've been beaten, they've been broken, you're weary, you're tired, you're worn out. But know this of your God. God is a God who takes plans and he flips the script. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, there's uh, this that we are told uh, of God. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You see, God is in the business of turning messes into messages. God is in the business of turning problems into opportunities. God is in the business of turning trouble into triumph. We constantly see that throughout God's word. Think about some of the stories that are chocked full in, in the scripture here. There's Joseph. Joseph was one of the, the baby brothers in the family. He wasn't in line to have any real authority. Uh, he, he, he has these dreams, and then he, he, his death is faked. His brothers sell him into slavery. He's entrapped. Then he's imprisoned. And later, he becomes the second most powerful man in the land through God's favor and God's working on his life. Then there's Moses. Moses was due to be slaughtered as a baby. He then grew up a prince, turned into a hot-headed, tempered, reactionary man that murdered somebody. He struggled with a speech impediment, yet God moves Moses to leadership, and he uses him to lead a triumphal exit out of uh, Egypt of the Israelites who had been held in bondage. Then there's Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute, and the woman who sold her body in the local tavern. I mean, she was like the most unlikely candidate to be a hero of faith, but in her obedience to God, he takes the plan, and he flips the script, and Rahab is now known for something much greater. David was the runt of the family, right? The least likely to become the second king of Israel, the most unlikely young man to defeat a giant. David was a shepherd, not a warrior, a boy, not a man, a servant, not a king. That was until what? God got a hold of his life, and God used him for a plan. Then there's Simon Peter in the New Testament, right? Simon Peter was like uh, good old boy. That's what you want to think of Simon, right? Good old boy. I mean, he was, he was making a living as a fisherman. That's because he didn't cut it in rabbi school. Like literally, he didn't cut it in rabbi school, and you're not good enough for that. So he, he moves into the family trade. He's going to become a fisherman, and, and, and fish is what he does. He is the guy that is quick to speak and slow to listen. That's the wrong way, just so you know, right? The foot in the mouth type of man. That was until God got a hold of his life. Jesus spoke into his life. And then what do we know now? Peter to be, right? Peter was one of the most instrumental figures of leadership that helped to establish the church of which now generations and generations and generations uh, have come and gone. And we are a testimony to some of the leadership of who Peter was. And there's Matthew. Matthew was a rotten tax collector who well, took many in society for their money. All he was out to do was think of himself. He was very selfish. Then he becomes selfless when Jesus gets a hold of his life and he eventually gets on mission for Christ. And, and because of that, he ends up being a martyr uh, uh, of death to, to who Jesus was. God is in the business of flipping the script, isn't he? Of, of taking the dumpster fire and turning it into a diamond in the rough. He does it in our lives and he does it in our life's circumstances. Paul clearly understood this. Uh, Paul clearly had an understanding that God's purpose was always greater than his own and that God's plan was going to prevail and that God's plan was ultimately better than his own. We, we learned of that in the book of Philippians in chapter one. It's on page 951 in the Bibles in front of you. So why don't you just turn over there with me? Uh, we're going to be in chapter one, verse 12. Uh, here's where we find Paul at this point. He's in prison for what he's doing. He's experiencing one of those difficult moments 
Verse 12 says this. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul had been thinking, he had to have been thinking, whoa, my my life is crumbling, right? He's in jail. No, no, that's not Paul. Paul is not thinking about his problems. He's instead thinking about the progress. He's thinking about how God is using this. He's saying, I'm not stressed, I'm strengthened, right? Paul's perspective is an unbreakable spirit of hope. It's not necessarily optimism that stupidly looks into the face of trouble and says, oh, whatever, I'm just going to have, like, the power of positive thinking. I'm going to be fine, guys. Like, Paul's not necessarily an optimist. He's a realist, right? A realist that says, I'm going to face difficulty. There are going to be hard times, but I know the God whom I serve. Pick up with me in verse 19. It says this, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will actually turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is saying, go ahead, kill me. I'm going to go be with Jesus. Oh, you don't want to kill me? That's all right. I'm just going to keep preaching Jesus. Like, how do you break a guy like that? You can't. Like, he, he, is, he has this unbreakable spirit. He's saying, it doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm trusting God, and whether I die or live, God is going to be exalted, and there's going to be great things that happen, and I'm going to experience the working of God in my life. He's just saying, trouble's just another chapter in my testimony, right? Or in our common culture, right? He's taking the lemons and he's making lemonade out of it. Now I want you to think about your, your crumbled plans. The things that you thought 2020 was going to bring. And I want you to open them back up. Hopefully you didn't tear them up, right? To open them back up, right? And on the back side of that, I want you to write God's plan. Make sure you write it big and bold. If you've got to go over it a couple times, God's plan plan. Right. Underline it a couple times. Make sure you remember this. God's plan. Now here's the deal. God's plan will prevail. While 2020 has brought some storms, God will see us through the storm. But here's where the rubber meets the road. All too often we are so focused on our plans. So focused on my plan. I got to make this happen that we never fully experience the flipping of the script and seeing God's plan worked out in our life because we don't let go. We hold so tightly to our plans thinking that we are in control, that we can just handle it on our own. We have a family that uh, is a part of our our campus in Vincennes and uh, they've had quite a year. Uh, 2020 has not only brought COVID for them, it's also brought uh, the death of a grandfather. Uh, it brought uh, the cancer diagnosis of the mother and the family and uh, many treatments because of that. Uh, just last weekend, their youngest daughter wrecked her car and totaled the vehicle. It's just been a year for them. And uh, Craig, uh, Kirk, the dad of the family, uh, he, uh, he shared on social media some of his thoughts and feelings, and he just said, look, man, I'll tell you this. The last six months, I found myself angry and frustrated at God more often than not. I, pre- I appreciate your vulnerability, Craig. I appreciate your willingness to be honest because it's hard to do those types of things. And as Craig shared that, he, he wrote this, and I just want to read it to you um, from his, his post. He said, God won't give us more than we can handle. It's not one that I believe in. I think he gives us more than we can handle on our own. He allows us the valleys and seasons of despair and fear and worry and hurt in order to remind us of where we are at in the context of our relationship with him. I'm convinced that God has allowed me this six months of hurt and worry to remind me of where I'm at in my relationship with him, to draw me closer to him, to remind me I can't handle these things on my own. Craig, you're right. 
You can't handle these on your own. None of us can. If we, if we would just let go and allow God to flip the script, we're gonna see something that is far greater than we could ever imagine. Letting go of our plans isn't easy though, is it? Because our plans make us feel comfortable, right? They, they give us a security, a sense of, of control. I, I know what my tomorrow's gonna bring, right? I got, I got a plan, I got, I got my list, things I'm gonna get accomplished, I got all these things I'm gonna do. Right? Letting go of tomorrow means that we have to trust that God is holding tomorrow. Walking through our lives with our hands clenched around my plan right, means that it's going to be a painful experience. Believe me, I've, I've tried it, and it is painful. When you make the decision to follow Jesus, you're oftentimes asked to repeat what's called the good confession. Right? The good confession is, I believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God, and I accept him as both Lord and Savior. You know, it's easy to make Jesus the Savior of your life. Making Jesus the Savior of your life is the moment that you accept the free gift of Jesus, that he really did come, live a sinless life, die a sinner's death, triumph over the grave, and live now, and because of that gives us the hope of eternal life. That's a free gift. It's easy to make him Savior. It's a lot more difficult to make him Lord, isn't it? Because Lord says, not my plan, not my will, but yours be done. Lord says, I got these things all worked out, God. I'm good here. No, no, no. I'm going to let go, and I'm going to trust you. Think about it like this. If you have a young child, this isn't hard for you to uh, think about. You've probably experienced it before. You're in a large crowd. Um, there's tons of people all around, and your little one's like on your hip, falling after you, and you're walking. Maybe you're headed to the restroom or trying to find your way out of the crowd. And uh, you can see. You kind of keep looking back behind and make sure they're there with you. And then finally, you begin to see the terror come across their face. They've lost you in the crowd, and they're kind of looking up at all the people that are twice as tall as them, and they're not sure where to go. And then they finally find you, and they look up at you, and they say, "Dad, Mom, I'm I'm just I'm scared, right?" And you can see the tears starting to well up in their eyes. As a mother or a father, you don't look down at your child and say, "Suck it up, kid," right? That's not what you say to them, right? Now, instead, typically, what you do in that moment, all right, if you pick them up, right? And you, you look them in the eye, you show them around a little bit, and you say, you don't worry, I've got you. I'm going to see to it that we find our way out of this chaos and crowd. Look, 2020 has been a year, hasn't it? And I think for some of us, that's about how we feel in our lives. Like all around us, it just seems so chaotic and so busy and there's so many problems and it seems like there's no control and what little control we thought we had is now spinning out of control. Look, 2020 has had so many of us experience the crumbling of our plans. And guess what? There's still three months left, right? I mean, like who knows what 2020 still got on the horizon? What if your political hopes don't pan out in this year's election? What if the job doesn't work out? What if someone that you care about deeply or even you yourself end up sick? What if the relationship doesn't go the way you hoped? What if the rite of passage gets canceled? What if the trip goes un that, that you had planned gets canceled? The cancer comes back? What if the commitment backs away? What if your plans don't pan out the way you had them planned? Will you keep holding on? Will you keep saying, God, I got this. I'm in control. I'm going to keep it together. I'm going to do my best. I, I, can, get the, I can get myself out of this. No, I'm going, to, I'm going to hold tight. Or will you trust God and allow him to flip the script and just simply trust him for tomorrow? You know, the first sin that we hear of in the garden is uh, in itself the embodiment of this struggle, right? The, the serpent slithers over. You want to be like God? You want to have control? You want to have your way? Just eat that fruit. That's all you got to do. That first sin is the embodiment of forgetting who they can trust. And the same has been true. It's weaved into every single sin that we've had since then. We think by taking it our way that some way it's better. 
but it's never better. Our way is never better than God's way. Bad things are going to happen in this world, aren't they? Like, can we just, can we just like lay that out there? It's promised by Jesus. Trouble's going to come. There are going to be problems on the horizon. There are going to be days where you feel like you've been knocked down one after another after another. And God says, that's all right. I'm going to be there with you. Someday these old tents of ours, that's what Paul calls it, the body, they're going to wear out. They're going to die. Like we are going to die physically. Someday, someday there's going to be a problem that you feel like you don't know what to do with, that your plan doesn't, doesn't have the answers for. And God is saying, would you just trust me? Listen to how the psalmist put it in Psalm 94. I think it's a reminder of this type of truth. Psalm 94, verse 17, unless the Lord had given me help, I would have soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. You know what that's saying? When I was in the chaos and I looked around and I didn't know where to go, my dad came over to me and he picked me up. He said, I got you. I'm going to walk with you. You're going to be all right. We're going to see to it that tomorrow comes and it's going to be far greater than you ever imagined it to be. All you got to do is trust me. Trust me. You know, there's a story uh, in scripture in Mark chapter 10 of Jesus is having this interaction with a man um, that we know as the rich young ruler today. It's on page 822 in the Bibles. Um, I, wanna, I wanna read it to you because uh, I believe it's got a lot of purpose behind it. Verse 17 of this passage uh, enters like this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud or honor your father and mother. Well, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Hmm. You know, the story of the rich young man is a story not so unlike our own. Now, yes, there's, there's definitely a point to be made about how finances can distract us. The scripture tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's constantly buying for our time. It's constantly buying for our plan, right? And so it's, yes, a story about money, but there's more to it, right? It's more than just money. This is a heart thing. Because deep inside of the rich young man's heart was the fact that his money made him feel like he was in control, and so he felt like, if I just have my money, I'm good. And the scene that unfolds there is so sad. Do this. And the rich young man went away. His head dropped, and he left. So what will 2020 look like for you? You going to keep holding on? You're going to keep white-knuckling these plans, gritting it out, thinking, I got it figured out. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to do all right. You can keep holding on. Are you going to be willing to to let go and allow God to flip the script. You know, years later, the apostle Paul finds himself um, in prison again. <laughs> you know, he, he finds his way to prison more often than not. And so he's in prison. Um, we believe this is probably the last uh, letter he's wrote, written. We, we believe he, he just maybe a month or two later has gotten out of prison and eventually um, is killed for his faith. Um, and uh, so Paul's writing this letter um, to what he calls his young son in the faith. It's a boy by the name of Timothy who he's left in a town of Ephesus to do some ministry. And uh, Paul is sitting in the prison. And just so you know, like this isn't like the posh prisons that we have around here. All right. Um, this is a hole in the ground, probably bars on top, no, no light coming in. There's probably feces all around him. Um, and he's scribbling out. We don't know how exactly he's scribbling out, what he's scribbling out, but he, he writes a letter to Timothy. And at the very end of that letter in chapter four, he tells Timothy this. He says, I fought the good fight. 
I finished the race. I've kept the faith. You know what Paul's saying? A long time ago, Timothy, I gave God my plans. I'm good. Because I know that God can be trusted. I let go. And I trusted him long ago. So, so how will the rest of 2020 play out for you? Will you keep trusting in your own plans, watching them crumble around you? Or you hand them over to God and watch something powerful take place. Look, there's a story uh, of the Israelites that uh, the Israelites were like a people that were constantly doing this. My plan. Uh, let's do God's plan for a while. No, we're going to go back to my plan. Uh, let's do God's plan, right? Like the whole Old Testament is filled with these people just like constantly like going like this. Well, they'll stay on their plan for a little bit and they're like, oh, we're doing something wrong. We got to get to God's plan. Ever feel like that? Been there before? Right? Like I did good today and then tomorrow I, 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 I'm going to decide to go my way again. That's kind of how the Israelites were. And I get to this moment and I, th- I think there's like a sense of like despair. Like I don't know if God loves us anymore. And the prophet Isaiah is, is prophesying to them, and it's recorded for us in Isaiah 43, his words. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I'm taking your crumbled plans of 2020 and I'm gonna flip the script and I'm gonna do something amazing. And you're gonna mark this season in your life by the year that you grew in faith more than you ever could. And as much as I had these plans and dreams to see more and more people maybe come in numbers to the church, I've seen so much deepening of faith through many of you who decided not my will anymore, but God's will for my life. It's freeing, it's exciting. All we got to do is let go and allow God to flip the script. Would you pray with me? God, thanks. Thanks for today. Uh, Thanks for the truths and promises of scripture because, boy, this has been a year that we needed them. A year that we needed to be reminded that, God, you are in the business of taking messes and turning into messages, of taking trouble and making it triumph, of taking problems and making them progress. God, we know you are doing an amazing thing. God, we're seeing it in the lives of friends and family. I'm seeing it in the lives of men and women in this church. But God, truth is, I see the struggle as well. I see the desire to hold on tightly. God, I've even been there myself. This wasn't a part of my plan. God, I didn't think this was gonna happen that way. God, today, it's my prayer that we would be a group of people that are willing to let go and let you have your way. As Jesus said in the garden, not my will be done, but yours. So God, as we walk out of these doors, God, as we walk back into our weeks, God, help us to continually let go and trust your plan. And God, use us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a society that is crying out in desperation. God, let us be the light of Christ to them. We love you. We thank you. Most of all for Jesus. And we say all this in his name. Amen.